North and South Korean technicians or delegations are, I mean, like uh, working on weapons project. They are in the same city, say like Rangoon, but the military intelligence makes sure these guys never, you know, uh, um, uh, bump onto each other. Yeah. And uh, what is South um, Korea doing? Well, South Korea is involved in conventional weapons program. They sell hardware. Uh, they provide some technology. That, you know. Um, and they come and fit um, uh, the machines for the, uh, for the uh, Ministry of Defense. Um, and then North Korea. Well, North Korea involvement is, is much more problematic. They are known to be involved in non-conventional or believed to be involved in non-conventional weapons programs. And also the, the Americans have accused both the uh, uh, basically Burmese regime of you know, being in violation of, like, I think, like re UN Security Council resolution that bars member states from uh, doing business with uh, North Korea. And so there's a lot of things happening. What, but what's interesting is the, um, the involvement of Singaporeans. Um, you know, si Singapore has had an extremely close tie with Nguyen's regime. You know, that goes back to, you know, uh, 80s and 70s. And uh, um, Singapore has been used as a place where the Burmese uh, you know, uh, tycoons would open front offices cover, you know, as a business and then they do, that's where a lot of these are made. And then um, in, in two minutes or uh, one minute I'll wrap it up. The, um, um, you know, so S Singa Singaporean banking facilities are used, yeah? And when, when I bring, the, bring up this issue of like, you know, uh, of, uh, Singaporeans um, providing uh, financial safe havens, they're always asking for, well, we don't have paper trail, you know, like, therefore we can't do anything. But uh, to me, what is more interesting is, as you may or may not know, Singapore has very little like, uh, natural resources, nothing to rely on except their own labor and you know, intelligence. So Singapore is building quite a few different sectors to, to keep their growth going. To, and one of the sectors that they're building is arms. Singapore has one of the world's fastest growing arms industries. Yeah? And then Singapore is a tiny island with you know, uh, just a, uh, a few or like maybe five or six million people. So Singaporeans sent their newly invented mod, you know, uh, weaponries to one of these defense industry sites that has, made, say, like uh, 100,000 acres for, to do the test firing. Yeah. And then they will leave these brand new equipment for the Burmese use, and they will pay the rental fee for the range. Yeah. And, 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 you know, uh, and so there are quite a few um, enablers um, that are uh, involved in this program. And I think one of the, my final comment is one of the most difficult things uh, to, to, uh, about Burma is that, you know, the, the Burmese military officer they are barred from communicating with any foreigner. Not even their wives who come and meet with their, you know, old friend's husband or wives who happen to be a foreigner, or English or American. And so it's a treason for the Burmese military officer to interact with any foreigner. So anyone who is interacting with the Burmese, sorry, like a foreigner, journalist or otherwise, they are authorized. And these guys are professionals and they're not spilling any beans. That is why you know, the CIA, you know, when Bob talked to like the British um, officials or, you know, others, um, you know, in the West, they are incredulous because they cannot penetrate, you know, uh, uh, what is happening under the radar. So when the B uh, DVB and Al Jazeera broke this story, they felt, you know, basically the, the you know, the activists and defectors evidence, the material, you know, turn out to be as credible as anyone's. And so I think what is important is, you know, in, in, in cases where um, the Western governments feel they need to do, you know, they want to do something, so they come up with what, what is called um, policy-driven evidence. Yeah. So in the case of Iraq, you know, like you know, Tony Blair's, uh, you know, famous, infamous line is, sex it up, sex the Iraq dossier up, you know, as far as MI6. Um, in the case of Burma, the Western government doesn't, or governments do not deem Burma a priority country. It's not a policy priority, therefore there is no will to do anything. So even though there is evidence, you know, to, to, to do something about it, about this program, there is no political will. So therefore there is no effective policy. 
So here's, you know, here's an a, a, a irony. You know, in, in, a cl- in, in a place like Iraq, you know, the, the Western governments use the policy-driven evidence. In our case, evidence is forcing policies to modify, to be modified, and yet the West is refusing to do it. And, uh, and uh, you know, the other question finally is, you know, that Burma is a signatory to the ASEAN uh, nuclear free weapons zone. And uh, so is ASEAN's um, uh, credibility on this issue, forget human rights and democracy, just, this is not the region best known for human rights and democracy. Um, but even, you know, do ASEAN leaders and governments mean what they say when they say we want this region nuclear free? Or do they just say it because this is the, you know, the tightest for non-proliferation? I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Zani. And I think that's a perfect segue to get Kavi uh, share his views because that's what he's going to grapple with, the ASEAN and <laughs> the nuclear threat from Burma. Well, thank you very much. After uh, listening to Bob and uh, Dr. Sani, I really uh, got really scared because I think uh, within the next few years, it's Burma have nuke. Uh, the first country that Burma would like to experiment on is Thailand. <laughs> having, having said that, I will speak on, t- uh, on, on two points. One is the attitude of Thailand towards all these the nuclear ambitions of Burma. And secondly, is, uh, I would discuss the ASEAN overall attitude. You might wonder why the Thai is so quiet about uh, all this talk about Burmese nuclear ambitions. From today, uh, from the presentation of Bob and also Mangzani, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, there is such a serious intent on Burma's part to become a nuclear power. And I think uh, the Thai uh, national security is still on denial. And I think uh, most of the Thai of official, except a handful group of uh, highly um, secret uh, military officers who believe in this uh, Burma nuclear ambition, the rest are just covered with fear. So they don't see Burmese nuclear threat as something really tangible. It's still very abstract because Thai fears dwell in the past and also in the present. Meng Sani mentioned a very good point that Burma threats uh, uh, is really non-traditional from the Thai point of view. You have seas of uh, migrant workers, two or three, up to three millions. You have uh, yaba, amphetamines, pills, and also uh, border skirmish and all sorts of problems. That is the real problems. And also we develop a very, what do you call, a deep, deep, deep fear factor, the psyche. When we talk about Burma, you know, we feel inferior because Burma 236 years ago, it burned down Ayodhya, or Ayodhya, the old capitals of uh, uh, Siam. For, m- for me, speaking strictly from Thai point of view, I think Burmese ambitions to acquire nuclear or no was actually was part of the cultural. I think Burma want to continue, I have to say this carefully, continue to intimidate, give the sense of superiority complex against Thailand. As you can see, Thailand now is an open society, it's you know, half-baked democracy, it's open, it's modernized. So you, you, you cannot uh, compare with Thailand. So Burma for a long time has been using, you know, and I think the Burmese uh, told me that uh, in Burmese language uh, there is a word called Nghe Nai, you know, been there, done that, you know. We, we just, you know, uh, destroy you, something like that. That kind of notion I think Burmese would like to develop. And this sense of uh, really this sense of deep, deep uh, psychology I think dictate. So it's like, you know, the North Koreas against South Koreas, the, the, the feelings between Israel vis-a-vis uh, Iran, you know, that kind of thing. So you have this kind of uh, deep, deep-rooted uh, uh, relation. That, that's how I, I see it. This is why the absence of the Thai serious thinkings are about this. And I, I cannot blame them, you know, because uh, they found... Uh, relief or they find expression in all kinds of ridiculous uh, drama uh, literatures that 
belittle Burma. So we must be the world leading country that produce the most ridiculous literature, uh, look downs against Burma all the time. That's how we found comfort and tried to discuss, uh, to disguise our fear. That's from my, my, my general feeling. So I think, um, apart from, from what a uh, small group of Thai military intelligence who believe that Burma is embarked on this, it's based on the persons that uh, I think Bob had mentioned. Uh, he's the um, Australian academic Desmond Ball who has been working with the Thai uh, intelligence communities for more than six years. In fact, I must uh, confess to you, I have the first briefing five years ago about these things uh, because uh, the Thai intelligence told me that uh, they intercept radio signals from North Korea to, to Burma that indicate that there's something going on between North Korea and uh, Burma. That's also explained why the United States is very interested in Burma. And I would argue that the Burma that uh, America policy toward Burma is really focused as a top priority on non-proliferation. It's not on opening up or democratization of Burma. I would argue that uh, non-proliferation issue is really the top priorities of uh, United States in trying to uh, uh, approach Burma because they realize that uh, if North Korea uh, getting involved in Burma, it could create a lot of problems. And I think the way uh, I would like to, to see this is that not only Thailand, but now I move to the context of ASEAN, is that the ASEANs have to seriously look into this matter. Last year, Thai Foreign Minister Kasit uh, uh, Pirom has raised this issue in the informal foreign ministerial meeting and asked uh, uh, Burmese about this uh, report. Certainly, Burmese uh, quickly dismissed the report. And the Thai uh, answer was that, well, thanks to your confirmation and dismissed the report. And, I, and the Thai expressed uh, the hope that uh, each uh, ASEAN member would be more transparent by producing a list of activity for peaceful use of nuclear power. So the Thai produced a two-page uh, peaceful use of activity, very much uh, to the surprise of, of ASEAN foreign minister. So I hope that uh, tomorrow ASEAN's uh, foreign minister will have an informal talk and Thailand would uh, raise this again. Because as you know, uh, in 1995, ASEAN's all member, uh, even to, uh, before Burma become member of uh, ASEAN in 1997, uh, Burma already signed the uh, Chon Phase Southeast Asia Nuclear Free Weapon uh, Weapon Free Zone. So I think um, ASEAN will seriously look at this issue. Certainly not within the next few months. I I think uh, for ASEAN, the focus is now try to see transition. You know, uh, after the elections in Burma, and I think credit has to be given to Vietnam, which has helped Burma to push down the Burmese issue as not a serious issue within the ASEAN uh, regional discussions. Uh, as you can see, uh, this year, as expected, South China Sea has topped the agenda of the so-called regional uh, issue, thanks to the Vietnam chair. If you compare to Thailand uh, last year, Thailand has done many unsuccessful initiatives, you know, which very much to the chakras of the rest of the ASEAN region. And this year, wonderfully, ASEAN has no initiative at all. Even one of the idea to send uh, a visitor to look at the Burmese uh, election on November 7 has been uh, uh, sort of uh, rejected by 